Good morning, Jana. Hi there. Good to see you. Make a little adjustments here. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Hi, Rita. Good to see you this morning. This fabulous Friday. Got my daddy on the phone with me and Stepmama Mary, and we're ready to go. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Donna. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. A message of faith today. That's right, Daddy. Yes, indeed. Good stuff today. Good stuff. I can't wait to get started. So let's just dig in. We're reading all the way through the Bible. If we start January the 1st, in Genesis 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, we end the last chapter of Revelation on December the 31st. We've done this for many, many years. Um, and my goodness, the Bible tells us his word never returns void. I just, I continue to get more and more and more good stuff from his word. And today, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but just want to encourage everybody, get you a one-year Bible, the one-year Bible reading plan. It comes in different translations. We happen to use the New Living Translation. I'm Elizabeth Inman uh, at Elizabeth Inman Ministries. You can find me on Elizabeth Sharon Ann YouTube channel, Elizabeth Sharon Ann Facebook page. This is where we do our daily Bible study. Uh, share this. Share it, share it, share it. And... Um, we have a big ministry that gives away Bibles. I say a big ministry. We're a little ministry here in Skytook, Oklahoma, getting bigger and bigger. How about that? But in, in, um, in the eyes of somebody who's hurting that we've been able to help, we're a big ministry. We uh, aim to help the hurting, give healing to a hurting world. And that's what we do here. And our foundation is through prayer. Our foundation is through reading God's word. And today we're in Ezekiel chapter 24 and chapter all the way through chapter 26. And it's quite a reading today. So Ezekiel was one of the major prophets of the time. He had been telling them over and over again, warning them. God had warned them. God had warned the people of Israel and Judah through many prophets, not just Ezekiel, to turn from their sins, to turn from their idle ways. We start right off in today's reading, Ezekiel chapter 24. And, you know, this is the start of the final siege of Israel and Judah. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and he's going to take them all away. And there's going to be a grief and a mourning that is beyond tears. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a few minutes as well. But <clears throat> um, it starts off with Ezekiel um, speaking about the cooking pot. Now, whether or not Ezekiel actually did the literal cooking pot or if he just used it to emphasize what God was telling him to say to them. I, I kind of think that Ezekiel took most things very literal. And again, we're going to see that here in just a minute as well. But if you really take and tear down the cooking pot and look at the spiritual meaning and look at the significance um, on this cooking pot, you'll see that it has deep, deep meanings. Um, Lori Cornell's watching. I'm hoping to get to talk to you maybe this weekend, Lori. Um, I got something I want to talk about with you. Anyway, um, moving forward. So my point with that is literally, literally, when, you know, we talk about being led by the spirit. We talk about being led by love. To me, those two words are interchangeable. God is love. So God is love. God is spirit. God is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Trinity, um, love is all three of those things. But as we learn to be led by the Spirit, that I want to be Spirit-led in my life more and more and more and more than what you'll see as that continues to grow in you, is that literally anything can be spiritual. Anything can be spiritual 
if we're looking with spiritual eyes. The marriage between a man and a wife is a spiritual thing that signifies the marriage of God's spirit and our spirit and the two shall become one. This cooking pot um, signifies what's been happening with the Israelites and the, and, and the people of Judah in their idolatry. It, it, is, is, it signifies that at this point in time of, of Ezekiel's prophecy, that they are uh, brewing. There's some words used in here that I, I don't want to get into because I, I, I could talk for, you guys already know this, I could talk for days about just the cooking pot. I got other things I want to talk about this morning. Uh, but it also signifies what's getting ready to happen. When, when he talks about pulling out the choice meats one by one, and then, and then keep in mind that this is, this is the final stage before the siege, before they come in and take the people into slavery and haul them off to Babylon. So anyway, anything is spiritual if we will but see. I want to move on over though. Um, now, one of the comments in my columns that will be with me for a long, long time, I wrote in my column, if you think about where we were this time last year, um, I wrote that the year that it, that 2020 was the year of refinement. God uses fire to refine us. I know many, many, many of us uh, still believe that this pandemic going forward is um, fire, that we've been going through the fire. Uh, and, and in many cases we have. But anyway, uh, I want to get on to Ezekiel being God's man. You know, I want to be God's woman. In fact, I'll just tell you, I believe I am God's woman. I'm his. I give myself to him over and over and over again. And when I feel myself tugging away, coming back, drifting back into the carnal things, then I will tell him once again to take me and to take me fully and completely to get out all of the dark things that's in me, to just pull them out. That if there's any darkness left in me, Father, get it out. And I trust him to know that as I'm prepared and as I'm ready, as he has prepared me, as he has renewed my mind, as I, through an act of obedience, read his word, he is refining my mind. He's renewing my mind and he's preparing me for this big, big string of darkness to come out. I'm ready now. And this string of darkness has been in me for a while, but I wasn't ready. But when I'm ready and God knows I'm ready, then out comes this one. And he delivers me of these things that's inside of me. That as long as I have a carnal flesh, there will continue to be things. And he'll just keep renewing my mind more and more and more. And I'll get more and more and more to where I think like him. That I use the mind of Christ that lives here in my heart instead of the mind of, of Elizabeth that lives up here in my brain. I'll stop trying to figure things out. I'll stop trying to think things through. And I'll read about a story about God's man named Ezekiel, who was his man at all costs. It was his, he was his man. And God tells him in advance that his wife is going to die. And then he goes on to tell him that when she dies, He's not even to openly mourn. And, and, and I'm just telling you, we can get so in-depth here. I could talk for a week about just verses 15 through 24. I could talk a week about just those, but I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Um, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to take time out of your weekend. I don't think. <laughs> I don't think. So, <laughs> um, one of the first things that we see is Ezekiel's tender heart. <clears throat> this was no small trial for Ezekiel. God's telling him not to cling too tightly to the things in this world, including his wife. But we know from the words that Ezekiel and his wife had a good relationship because in verse 15, when God gives him the message, this message came to me from the Lord, son of man, with one blow, I will take away your dearest treasure. 
uh, there's another translation that says that she was the delight of his eyes. That signifies an intimacy and a, and a relationship that was very, very, very important to Ezekiel. And it teaches us that we're not to cling too tightly to the things of this world. <clears throat> and it also teaches us that his wife was tied to his ministry. And then we can kind of look back through the history of our Bible and see about marriage, to see about husbands, to see about wives. Abram lied twice about his wife, Sarah. Abraham lied twice about his wife. Very significant in the history. Uh, Moses was publicly criticized over the wife that he chose and, and then had a whole ordeal over that. Um, Moses' wife actually saved his life by circumcising him, if you remember the story. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess, and she gave him two sons that was very significant in history. Jeremiah wasn't allowed to have a wife at all. Paul didn't have a wife at all. And then Hosea was instructed to go marry a prostitute. Now, you'll see that God taking out Ezekiel's wife is not a pattern. So we don't have to look at that and say, oh, well, it's God's heart to kill our spouses. No, 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 no. This is the only instant and, and instance. And on top of that, it's so significant by what was going on. I mean, he just got through displaying and, and illustrating things to the people in a final warning by using the cooking pot as, as an illustration of it. And it's also not the only time that the priests have been told not to mourn publicly. See, the difference is, is God didn't tell Ezekiel not to mourn privately. In fact, he refers to that. He refers to it in verse 17, groan silently. Um, there's another translation that calls that, um, there's, a, I forgot what it was, the other word, groan silently, oh, sigh, sigh, sigh silently, and, and I, I'm not even going to go into, since we don't use the translation that uses the word sigh, I'm not going to go into all that I read about the sigh, but it's extremely significant in that God wasn't telling him not to mourn silently. Um, and then Leviticus chapter 21, verses one through four is where it, it refers to the fact that priests were not to mourn and grieve publicly. Um, God understands Ezekiel's pain. And by having these words written down for us and, and him telling him to groan in silence or sigh in silence shows the compassion in God's heart that he does understand that Ezekiel's going to mourn and grieve. But, but there's a reason why he didn't want him to mourn publicly. Um, I mentioned that this isn't a pattern of God's work, um, but it is showing us that we're not a slave to our emotions. He sets the example for us that we're not a slave to our emotions. He sets the example for us that it is okay for us to grieve privately. In fact, I will tell you that after years and years of reading his word and and have an intimacy with my father, I, I come to realize very, 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 very deeply that God created mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. He created grief, the emotions of mourning and grief. God created sadness. God created fear. God created every, happiness, joy, peace. He created everything. He created everything. And when he created everything, it was for us. And for a purpose, for his purpose, for us. So there is a there is a there is a reason to have fear, and it's for our physical safety. There is a there is a reason for mourning and grief, and it is for our healing, healing purposes. But but we just read about the the cooking pot. 
And now we're reading about God taking away Ezekiel's wife, the, his most treasured thing, the, the, the delight to his eyes, um, um, the dearest treasure, his dearest treasure, because he's, he is showing them and giving them a, the example that sometimes there's a mourning and a grief that we can go through that's beyond tears. And that's what was getting ready to happen to these people, that that they wouldn't even have time to cry and mourn as they're being ravaged by the Babylonians, as they're being taken into captivity. And the loss would be so great that tears doesn't even do it justice. Doesn't even do it justice. Now, how do I apply this to my life right now? Um, let me make sure I've got all my notes. I want to share everything I wrote down this morning. Uh, Ezekiel's wife represented the defiled temple you can you can see that i mean he goes on to even explain that in here um this is what the sovereign lord says in verse 21 i will defile my temple temple the source of your security and pride and we can see the type and shadow of that um the delight to ezekiel's eyes his his dearest treasure see the israelites had taken their ritualistic lifestyle into the temple and had defiled the temple by worshiping the very act of sacrifices that they did. They had gotten so far off that narrow road. Um, you know, and I want to point out too that the whole book of Ezekiel in and of itself is a revelation of God himself, even in the middle of tragedy. Um, but it's a grief beyond tears. And, and how does this apply to us today? It applies to us today. And especially, I think that's why this impacted me so strongly this year, because this is a second year of a pandemic. By now, I, I don't know that there's anybody alive that hasn't known of somebody that's died of COVID. There's still so much uncertainty. There is definitely so much division. There was division in the reading that we're talking about today. Thus, there was no need for a cooking pot if there wasn't division. There was division. In fact, division is what caused an awful lot of what we're reading about. But it's a picture to those of us who belong to God. Um, I had a, had a pastor one time that required of a widow to be the one to speak at her husband's funeral. And, you know, and that's a little bit hard to understand until you start reading the book. And then all of a sudden we see what God required of Ezekiel and what seems in today's environment so cold and so calloused and so hard. When you get into the heart of what God was doing in this story today, Ezekiel was so much God's man that he couldn't help but obey God. And, and it was who he was to God and God was to him. More importantly, Old Covenant, it was so much more important who God was to Ezekiel because he didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible for him to get up and proclaim that his wife was going to die, and then to get up without tears and without mourning and without public wailing like they did back then. The method of, of normal grief and mourning was a public display of tearing your clothes, putting on ashes, and wailing and grieving openly. And, and Ezekiel showed the level of significance of who he was to God and who God was to him by being able to be stoic and to go forth the very next morning and do. The morning of, he did what God told him to do. And the next morning after, he got up and did exactly what God told him to do. Is that where we're at in our life? Is that where we're at? Am I so much Tom's woman that I would be taken out and rendered useless? 
I, I mean, I'm just telling you what God's speaking to me or what, maybe I shouldn't even say it that way. Maybe, maybe I'm just sharing with you my personal journey as I read these scriptures about, I know how much I love my husband. And I think he knows how much I love him and where we're at in our life right now. And I read a story like this and I read that his wife signified the temple. And then he, and then I speak, you know, because why? Because we, we get it when we know that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Then all of a sudden, I, it's not so foreign when I say that Ezekiel's wife represented the temple. And that it goes on then to say that the people had defiled the temple. That's why she had to die. I mean, we're Old Testament here. We're Old Covenant here. This gets deep. I don't even know how deep to take it, but this gets deep. And then back to woo, 2021. Okay, why am I having to read this? What? Why do I have to read that Ezekiel lost his wife simply because he was God's man? <sighs> am I the called or am I not? Am I the chosen <clears throat> or am I not? Do I have a ministry or do I not? Are there people who's watching or are there not? You know, see, it's easy for you guys to sit out there and say, well, yeah, Elizabeth, we're on here with you. <coughs> yeah, Elizabeth. <coughs> oh, I must have got excited because talking's got my throat tickling. <coughs> it's easy for you to point a finger at me and say, well, yeah, you've got a ministry. You've got people who watch you. <coughs> you get up and teach, Elizabeth. You, you do retreats. But you guys already know what I've said so many times to you. I don't care if you're sitting there somewhere in Podunk, America, watching <clears throat> Elizabeth Sharon Ann on Facebook talk about a Bible reading. You've got people who's watching you. You are a leader right where you're at. Nobody's exempt from that. <clears throat> and when tragedy strikes, if indeed we are who we say we are, we say we're his, we say that we're a follower of Jesus Christ, we represent who they call as Christians. You know, we do more to run people off and away from Christianity than what any of the evil people do at times. When bad news comes, does it just totally wipe you out? Are you rendered useless? <coughs> if, if bad news comes, and, and we've not given, we're, we're not, bad news comes and we're given the opportunity to show who Jesus is in our life. Are we so busy and so caught up in ourselves that we're rendered useless? I mean, Ezekiel was not rendered useless at all. Even in prison, even in prison, the prophets were not rendered useless. When, when, when they were thrown into prison. When Paul was thrown into prison for things he wasn't even guilty of, at least the prophets were guilty of something. They were guilty of defying a king by telling him that, oh, no, you're not going to win that war. Uh, God says, thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> they threw him in prison because they spoke the things of God. For Paul, they didn't even have a good excuse for throwing him in prison. He had broken no laws. <clears throat> Are, are we rendered useless by our emotions? See, this is the picture that it's not wrong to have the emotions. But it is wrong when we allow our emotions to take over to the point that, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he broke up with me. Oh, I just my life is over. I'm just I can't even function now because he broke up with me when you probably wasn't even supposed to be with him to begin with. Anyway, I got to get to the, I got to get to the even better parts. I, I think it's even better and I'm almost out of time already. Hebrews chapter 11 for crying out loud, the chapter of faith. <laughs> I love this chapter, but you know what? <clears throat> I really want to talk about things 
that's related to the chapter instead of the chapter itself today. Because it's one thing to sit here and read, and it absolutely positively does build our faith when we read Hebrews chapter 11. First and foremost, it gives us the definition. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. We live by faith, not by sight. We call those things that are not as though they are. Faith, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Faith is faith, faith. And then we think about, well, how can I get more faith? How can I, well, I guess, you know, I, I just use it as an excuse because I don't have enough faith. Those are all lies because, because the very first thing that came up in me when I started reading today is how God has already given us our measure of faith, that God himself took and said, okay, Elizabeth, I want you to have X amount of faith. Here's enough faith for you. And he tells us that if I just have enough faith as a grain of a mustard seed, that I can speak to that mountain in front of me and it'll be thrown into the sea. I just have to have the faith of a mustard seed. And yet Romans chapter 12, verse three tells us that God has given us the measure of faith and it is the faith of God. It's the same faith that Jesus Christ had on this earth. It's the same faith that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> And Ephesians chapter two, verse nine tells us that that faith is a gift from God, that it's through grace that we have faith. It's a gift of God. It, it's not something I earned. It's not something I deserve. It's, it's faith is a gift from God. And that we can ask God to increase that faith, which in my mind, now that I've read all the way through the book so many times and I've studied faith, because in my life, I felt like there were so many times I had no faith. And I realized I, I believed a lie when I, I thought I had no faith. I believed a lie. Of course, if the enemy can convince us we don't have any faith, then we're not going to live by faith because we believe we have none. The truth is God's already pre-measured how much faith we'll have by the time we're born. We, are, we already have faith. It's a free gift. But we can ask him to strengthen it, strengthen our faith. Luke 11, verse 9, Luke 17, verse 5, Mark 9, verse 24. And then it does tell us that we are to exercise our faith and that as we exercise our faith, it gets stronger. Romans 12, verse 1, uh, Romans 6, verse 8. And then it tells us that God is the author. Our faith comes from God and he's the finisher that he will finish what he starts in us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is Hebrews 12, verse two and Romans 8, 29 through 30. <clears throat> and then it tells us in Ephesians that grace enables our faith. Grace enables our faith. Free gift of God, free gift of God. Such powerful things, powerful things. Hebrews chapter 110, verses one through seven. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under my feet. And then I wrote out in previous years, Hebrews 10, 13. I should have looked that up this morning. Hebrews, wonder if I can find it real quick. Hebrews 10, 13. Let's just see what that says. Hebrews 10, verse 13. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. Oh, Hebrews 10, 13 says the same thing. Hebrews 1, 10, um, 1 says, okay. Hmm. Verse four, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are forever. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. Good, good, good stuff. And then Proverbs 27, 14, a loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. I laughed at that one. I've always been a cheerful person in the mornings and I lived through a period of time that um, that wasn't appreciated. 
and here it is. And then I got to thinking as I read that, um, what if we, right where we're at, all of us right where we're at started writing down tidbits of wisdom that we have because that's just that's what Solomon did that's yeah. what we're reading we're reading what Solomon wrote down as bits of wisdom now we're not Solomon we'll never have the level of wisdom that Solomon has although the Bible tells us that if we want Solomon like uh, faith uh, follow Solomon like wisdom we're to ask and that he'll freely give it but but here this is this is this is meant to build you up we can read these tidbits from Proverbs and we can just be in awe of the level of wisdom that Solomon had. But what God, I believe this morning was instilling in me is that, Elizabeth, you've got far more wisdom than you give yourself credit for. Sherry, you've got far more wisdom than you give yourself credit for. Nancy, if you just started writing down all the little bits of wisdom that you have, you would be amazed. You would be amazed. I mean, I can go through here, D and Donna and 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 Cindy and and Carol and all of you, Shirley, all of you guys, Larry and and Joe and 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 Vic, if you just wrote down tidbits of wisdom all the time, you'd be amazed. You would be amazed at how much wisdom you have. On this fabulous Friday, November the 12th of 2021. Thank you guys for your faithfulness in reading God's word. As you read, your faith is strengthened and exercised. You get more faith through reading. That's what the Bible tells us, that our faith is strengthened as we read. And it just boils down to, it just boils down to trusting God. Choose this day to trust God. Just trust him right where you're at. Don't work harder, just trust him. Don't work harder. It's not about what you do. Work hard. Work hard. He tells us to work hard. Work as though unto the Lord. But just trusting. Trusting. Our whole world will change when we make the decision to exercise the faith he's given us and just say, this day, I choose to trust God. I trust him. Lord, I trust you. And I love you guys.